thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, here to to deal about uh, the topic of electromobility and energy transition. Uh, my name is Yannick Perez. I'm coming from France. Uh, in the French system, it's quite complicated to be only in one university, so uh, I have a shared position between three universities. Uh, University Paris Sud, University Central Supélec, and the SEC Business School. Basically, it means that I'm trying to make works which combine uh, economics, management, and engineering. Uh, meaning that I am an economist and I don't much know about the other things, but I try to make something workable about that. So the introduction is basically uh, based about what energy transition is and what uh, electric cars, if they are efficiently managed, can help the transition towards uh, more uh, climate change mitigation programs. So the outline of my presentation will be uh, organized in four points. You will have first uh, sort of global introduction about uh, the electromobility challenge for networks. And second, we will look at uh, flexibility provision thanks to markets. Second, we will uh, look at uh, flexibility provision by contractual arrangements, and then we will try to see what we can conclude about electromobility and energy provision. So first, electric cars are booming. Uh, five years ago, electric cars were not existing. Today, we are reaching three million electric cars being used daily on the streets around the world. So it means that uh, there's a lot of storage facilities which are paid by people who want to move from one point to another. So the question of who is going to pay for electricity storage solution is sold by every buyer of an electric car. And the new topic is how much of this electricity could be used to do something different than just mobility. And electric cars are enjoying a very nice thermal dynamic. In the coming years, it, expected, it is expected by uh, all the observators that cost of battery will decrease and energy density of the battery will increase. Which means that for electric mobility, a very nice double dynamic because it will be cheaper to put more batteries and it will take less space to put more energy to move the cars. And if you are an economist, when you see a price which is divided by 10, you think that something happens. It's very rare in the economic environment that a price is divided by 10. And normally, if a price is divided by 10, I'm going to use more of that. Whatsoever the what is. And the third thing is that electric cars are emitting less CO2 in the atmosphere than the over gas lines. If and only if you don't fuel the car with uh, coal generation units or uh, oil, oil units. So if you are using any fuel mix which is not 100% coal like in Poland or 100% diesel, then you make some savings when you use electric cars instead of uh, classical cars. The greener your energy mix, the less you are emitting CO2 in the atmosphere, of course. So, what does it change? Uh, this graph roughly shows you what was the organization of the uh, electricity sector before the reforms and before uh, the, the last new innovation which takes place on the field. Generation units put electricity on transmission grids, then distribution grids are used to uh, distribute electricity to the different levels. And then we start to make some innovation in, like massive renewable energies which are connected to the transmission grid, which were a small game changer. And then we add decentralized generation, PV panels. And PV panels are much more disruptive towards the classical 
energy sector because the flows are now not going from the generation to the distribution, but they can be two ways. And it means that something is happening here on the demand side that is changing the way the um, system should be organized. And here we have storage. So it means that the storage provision could be used to do things with, like providing some distributional solution for the grids if they need any backup, or to provide solutions to the different actors here, at the residential sector, at the commercial sector, or at the industrial sector, if this fleet of electric cars are well managed. The more you have PV installed, the more there is strange things happening on your electricity network. This is what happened in California in the last years, and they call it the duck curve, because this is supposed to be a duck. Okay, if you are coming from US, you see a duck. If you are coming from elsewhere, probably you see just a strange curve. But the duck means that the classical load curve here is impacted by the PV generation. The more you install PV generation, the more during the day you have some production replacing traditional production and traditional generation. And the more at the night you need to have a very fast system to ramp up and to replace the fact that you have no electricity when the sun disappears. But it's also the case with wind. The more you have wind, the more you need a backup power. Here it's the Spanish case in which one day you could have very few wind, only 1% of the fuel mix during one hour is coming from wind. Nothing happened too much. The wind turbines are not spinning too much. And on the opposite, there is days in which you have a lot of wind and a lot of over-generation facilities are not used. The problem is, as the previous presenter says, that electricity system now needs more flexibility. Flexibility for PV management, flexibility for wind management. And flexibility can come from different sources, and the point here is, of course, more flexibility comes with storage. And the more you have EV fleets, the more you could provide this flexibility where needed. So, the point of the presentation is to show you that there is electrical fleets that can provide this flexible capacity if they are efficiently managed. And they, provide it, they can provide it at different levels. At the level of the transmission grid for frequency, or ancillary services, primary, secondary, tertiary reserves. They can provide it to the distribution grid for congestion management at the distribution grid for um, provision of uh, energy locally. But they can also provide it energy at the building level. And if you have uh, 10, 12 electric cars in the basement, in your uh, parking lot, then you can provide also flexibility to the building. But you can also provide flexibility to the house level at the distribution side. Or you can even go for being disconnected from the grid and assume that if you have a large battery in your car, for some or for whole, you could be off grid which is, of course, the more uh, extreme case. So, how we can use these uh, storage facilities and to put them on the market? First is to look at in which markets could we sell this uh, flexibility provision. If there is no market, then we will explore the other solution. But 
in some regions around the world, in Europe, in the US, in New Zealand, etc., there is a lot of markets which, where flexibility can be traded. And mainly in terms of primary and secondary reserve or balancing services, energy or capacity, there is different products that you could, uh, that you could address with electric fleets. The most easy and um, attractive one for electric fleets are this yellow part, meaning close to real time and based on reserves or balancing services. For the rest, for intraday market, spot market or forward market, it seems today that these markets are not the more promising one in the next two or three years. In ten years probably, yes, but for today, no. So the idea is to manage electric fleets on the one hand. Okay. We have another. So the idea is to manage uh, electric fleets, each car individually, and to create, thanks to this data management, bundles of services that you could put on markets. This is all the markets that we can address and offer in if we are capable of managing electric fleets. And today, uh, the most promising ones are for frequency regulation, tertiary reserve markets, or balancing services. But one day, all these services would be addressed by a fleet of electric cars. What we have done is we have explored, thanks to different projects, the feasibility of providing uh, flexibility provision with a fleet of electric cars. And the results coming from the field show interesting results. First one, in the US, when you have a fleet of electric cars providing uh, frequency regulation, each car is paid around 1.5 thousand euros per year and per car to provide flexibility to the grid, which is, compared to the cost of the car, a very nice valuation of the battery of the car. If we do the same type of calculation with the French case, we find similar results only if we have quite large connection to the grid. The problem with frequency regulation management is that the rules of the game today are created for previous generation technologies. Nuclear, gas, coal, and they are very efficient as a barrier to entry for uh, innovations and new technologies. So now the, the aim of this project is to show to the TSOs, the TSOs that we can provide this type of flexibility to them by field trials and proof of concepts. But in some regions, we think that or because there is no market, or because the local company, the local energy company, will not be happy to see a new competitor, probably in these regions, we will have no market possibilities for having an active energy management coming from the fleets. So it's not a problem, because storage facilities are very flexible, even in the way we can uh, put them on the market. And if there is no market solution, we can find contractual <coughs> solutions. So contractual solution means that we will not sell this flexibility provision to the grid. We will sell it to the building, meaning that we are going to speak with the, um, site, the site manager, let's say the owner of this building, and we are going to offer him a solution to minimize its energy cost over time, to maximize his PV panel consumption, if he has one, 
or the local energy, uh, renewable energy he may have. We will propose him to, man to minimize the peak demand he addressed to the network, or even to reduce his uh, network connection fees that he should pay in order to be connected to the grid. And if you do so, then there is a possible sharing of these benefits that could happen between the building user, the building manager, and if the TSO is not too uh, conservative, some of the benefit could also be shared with him. If we cannot discuss with any building, then we can propose solution to the house manager. People are buying electric cars, so they will need a solution to refuel it. And the first place they will refuel the car is in their own house or in their own facility. So the same question arises, what can we offer to the guy which has an electric car and which owns a house in terms of flexibility services? We can offer him to minimize its energy cost over time, to maximize his self-consumption, or to manage the network conjection fees he has to pay toward the networks. He could also provide some congestion solution to the distribution grid if the, con the distribution grid is not too conservative. The last solution is the dream cell by Tesla. And Tesla says basically that uh, if you install rooftop PV panels plus home storage plus a Tesla car, basically you don't need to be connected to the grid. You will cover all your consumption thanks to PV panels which are here, hidden in the rooftop, with your very nice Tesla car and the test uh, storage solution. And as you can see in the picture, there is no grid. There is no line. So you could be offline and perfectly happy. Of course you will buy a lot of products from Tesla and they will be very rich. But that's of course the reason why companies are making business usually. So conclusions. Connected EV fleets are a game changer because you propose to people which have already taken the decision to have a battery to manage the battery in a smart way. So you don't have to ask them if they want a battery because they have bought a battery already. So the question is how do you optimize the very expensive battery you have already bought? But of course I'm not very good at predicting the precise future of EVs because I don't know how it works, uh, I'm just an economist, so I sometimes use this trick that if uh, all of you in the room, you were asked in the 80s about having a camera on your phone, you will have probably pulled your last uh, Samsung one and say, of course, if I have to put a camera in my phone, it will look like, like this. This is what I have imagined. It's slightly different I'm coming from. The time in which a phone was a fixed line phone and a camera was a reflex camera. So I don't know what the future of innovation is. But we have also some papers which try to explore that. Thank you very much.